Cabin Crew The flight and cabin crew of an airliner should always aim to act as one cohesive crew. This may be severely tested in non-normal or emergency circumstances. In almost all other respects the crew is treated as two separate entities, flight deck and cabin crew. They are recruited by and work for different departments. Indeed the recruitment criteria are amazingly dissimilar. They wear different uniforms, have different pay and conditions and they have a radically different career structure and level of qualification. The specific tasks allotted to each group are widely dissimilar as are the respective levels of responsibility. This difference between flight deck and cabin crew can and does lead to a number of difficulties. Ignorance of each other's tasks, duties and responsibilities. Refusal to communicate adequately under normal conditions. To have a them in a situation. With weak or indifferent leadership, it can lead to a situation where multiple leaders emerge thus having a team without a commander. Worse still can occur with weak or indifferent leadership, which can lead to the assumption of authority by those with no right to exercise it and without proper knowledge of the responsibility which that authority bestows. Clearly with these sorts of problems existing it is not surprising that events sometimes go awry in both normal and non-normal situations. It is clear that good, firm leadership from the flight deck crew, and in particular the captain of a flight, will influence the attitudes and actions of the cabin crew and thus bypass many of these potential obstacles. Good communication is required among the crew. Note that although in these notes it is editorially expedient to deal with the flight deck and cabin crew as separate, we must still try to consider the crew as a whole. Communication should be both concise and precise as well as being delivered at the correct time. Given all of this, the efficiency of the operation in normal circumstances should be maximized and the potential for miscommunication in any non-normal circumstance minimized. The following section provides some generalized guidance on liaison with your cabin crew before, during, and after a flight. Remember that the cabin crew is your eyes and ears in the cabin and that certain of their tasks like the safety briefing, life jacket demonstration, etc., are your responsibility, legally, but are delegated to the cabin crew to perform. Customer service is an immensely important part of the commercial aspect of airline operations these days. The cabin crew plays an important part in this, but we must not lose sight of the primary reason for cabin crew, safety. So under no circumstances must service, however important, infringe upon safety. Pre-flight, initial contact with your cabin crew through a short briefing is important for various reasons. For one, it permits the introduction of all crew members, thus establishing a who's who for the entire crew. This is particularly important to ensure that new crew members feel part of the team. It allows for the exchange of information relevant to the forthcoming duty. This will set the tone for the day. You will have opened the door to two-way communication by the disclosure of this information at this moment getting rid of any communication barrier that might have existed. By ensuring a proper instruction it indicates to the crew that you are concerned about their welfare. This goes a long way to creating a team spirit that should outlast the duty period. By the passing of information at the briefing you show that you are efficient and keen to ensure that the job is done properly. It is to be hoped that the rest of the crew will follow you as an example. And most importantly, it creates the one crew we have been talking about before, instead of two separate entities. In an airline, it often is difficult to do a crew briefing in the briefing room in the technical building. If this is the case always try to go on board the aircraft a bit earlier so you can conduct a briefing on board. In the rare case where even this would not be possible, it would show good leadership, as a commander of the flight, to at least introduce himself to the crew in a way that doesn't hinder the operation. The briefing is unlikely to take more than a few minutes and whichever of the following are relevant should be included. Names of the crew, flight and cabin, to get acquainted with break the ice. Flight times. Flight conditions. In particular, turbulence is at cat, ts, or simple low. Altitude turbulence caused by strong winds. These are the conditions most likely to have an impact on cabin service and safety. Legalities, people called from standby. Make sure everybody is legal to perform the duty of the day. Slot time slash delays. Refueling or not. If it is a training flight, inform the crew about jump seat occupants or any other operational constraint. Any other information you deem necessary. The cabin service on his or her turn should inform you about. Any training taking place in the cabin provide you with a list of names, duty positions, and staff numbers of the cabin crew. Given the above information, the cabin service will now have a clearer picture of the likely workload and can plan accordingly. And once more, now the crew will feel much more like being part of one team.
on routes where problem passengers are known to exist, for example, with excessive hand baggage or alcohol-related behavior problems, a reassuring word to your cabin crew that they have your full backing to deal with the situation will improve that confidence to deal with it properly. As a result, you are less likely to be bothered later in flight or post-flight with endless horror stories which you can do little about. On board. Once on the aircraft but before departure, the need for communication between the flight deck and cabin crew still exists. It is becoming more important as the situation is now dynamic and errors or omissions can have serious consequences. Cabin defects. The cabin service must be advised of any cabin defects relating to cabin equipment or furnishings. This may, for example, save them the time and effort of loading meals into an unserviceable oven only then to have to unload and reload them, possibly in the galley at the other end of the aircraft and quite possibly in flight. This sort of occurrence may have a considerable effect on cabin service and can be easily avoided. This also will prevent the cabin service from re-entering a previously entered defect in ignorance. This saves time, theirs, yours, and the engineers. Any defects discovered pre-flight or at any later stage should be reported to you by the cabin service. The necessity of that item should be considered and if required engineering called without delay. More routine items such as replenishing the potable water or toilet servicing may also need attention. These should be advised immediately to the load controller if present or via radio communication to the company or handling agent. Cabin Defects Book This book is an annex to the aircraft technical log. Defects relating to cabin furnishings or equipment are entered by the cabin crew in the cabin defects log and the entry is signed and dated by the crew member making the entry. To legitimize the log page it must be countersigned by the captain. The defect will subsequently be rectified and annotated as such or will be carried forward via a technical log page and annotated and cross-referenced accordingly. Any defect recorded relating to an item of safety equipment must be entered in the technical log as a defect. A full list of items to be transferred can be found in Flight Operations Manual Part A, as it is a legal document that reminds the cabin service that they need to write in block capital letters, sign, and date each item as they usually don't. Boarding Time the cabin service must be made aware of the intended boarding time of passengers at an early enough time to enable compliance. Factors that will cause boarding time to vary should of course be taken into account. These include such variables as slot time, disabled, lift on, passengers, serviceability of the APU, for air conditioning, time to transport passengers to a remote standby bus, and inevitably a host of others. An essential prerequisite for boarding is the completion of the cabin security check, the cabin service is required to inform the captain that the check is complete and that the aircraft is free from unidentified or suspicious objects. A form proving this has to be signed by the captain, it seems obvious but is all too often overlooked that cabin clearing must be completed and all cleaners, and other non-crew personnel, and their equipment should be away from the aircraft before the security check can commence. Should a decision to board whilst refueling or refueling with passengers aboard be necessary, then the cabin service must be briefed, and the procedure in Flight Operations Manual Part applied. Local regulations concerning the procedure must also be adhered to. These may include the attendance of fighting personnel and equipment, the placing of steps, or other means of egress. Some airport authorities prohibit refueling with passengers aboard. Local ground staff, engineers, or refuelers should be able to advise on local regulations. In flight. ETA. Keeping cabin crew up to date with flight progress is important, particularly on short, busy flights. In the short sectors their flexibility to accelerate the service if flight. Time is reduced is minimal, the only option being to somehow curtail the service if circumstances dictate to avoid the situation a realistic estimate of arrival time should be given early in the flight, usually, short sectors pose greater demand and stress on cabin crew, thus good coordination can mitigate or reduce such stress. Early advice of a delayed ETA due to holding, increased track distance, runway change, etc., should be given as this may allow completion of service or at least allow it to be completed in a more relaxed fashion. Of more importance is a situation where an ETA has been brought forward significantly due to a reroute. Such a significant reduction in flight time may leave the cabin crew unprepared for landing and thereby cause a go-around. A timely announcement and switching on the seat belt sign will keep cabin crew up to date on the flight progress and allow them to pace the last part of the service and prepare the cabin for landing. Turnarounds The cabin crew will normally rise to the challenge of a quick turnaround but may need the occasional prompt. As captain your job is to manage the turnaround in the main by delegating tasks to your crew, the engineers, and ground staff. In this area tact and diplomacy including the words please and thank you will achieve far more than the sergeant major approach. 
Becoming too involved with accomplishing tasks may diminish your capability to supervise the turnaround and detect which task is liable to be the critical one I. E. Last to be completed. This may prevent timely corrective action from being taken. In these cases, it can be helpful to delegate the technical aspects of the flight to your first officer so you can handle the managerial tasks. Meal breaks. It is obvious that, when possible, crew meals should be consumed as near to normal meal times as possible and obviously on a lot of flights this is hardly possible. Difficulties can also arise on routes where short, multiple sectors are operated. Here it may be that by deferring a meal break to a later turnaround, which is of longer duration, the meal may be taken in a more relaxed and sociable atmosphere than is the norm. However, when contemplating this, the physiological aspects, especially the time since the crew last ate must be considered. A crew whose members have low blood sugar levels, hypoglycemia, due to a lack of recent nourishment is less likely to cope well with routine tasks and may fail to cope adequately with any non-normal circumstance. Note, symptom short temper, inability to exercise proper judgment, and to make sound decisions. Do not be tempted to coerce your crew to skip a meal entirely to make up time. The time saved is at best minimal as eating almost always takes place concurrently with other turnaround activities which would prevent passengers from boarding at an earlier time. Should you attempt this you will end up with a hungry and dispirited crew who will not give their best to our passengers and may well introduce you as Captain Blight. Unexpected turbulence. If the encounter is of sufficient duration or severity then the fasten seat belt sign must be illuminated and a PA made. Normally the cabin service will make this PA, but in the event of a sudden onset of significant turbulence the cabin crew, for their safety, may need to be secured as well and in this case, a PA by the flight crew may be necessary. The PA should be as reassuring to the passengers as possible and as informative to the cabin crew as is reasonable. The onset of even light to moderate cat at altitude can be scary for even seasoned travelers, inexperienced passengers may well be terrified by the experience. The cabin service will give you a cabin secured check once the cabin is secured. It is good to mention to the crew during the briefing to call you if they feel the turbulence to be significant and you haven't turned on the fasten seat belt sign yet, as in the cockpit the feel can be different from the tail of the aircraft. Diversions In the event of a diversion the cabin service director will have several questions, which will include Where are we going to? What happened? How long before we reach there? What happens when we get there? Have your answers ready, as inevitably a diversion increases the workload of the entire crew and they need relevant information to enable them to plan that workload. Diversions, and to some extent tech stops, are situations where maximum flexibility of all concerned is required to expedite matters and minimize disruption to our passengers. It would be advisable to contact OCC as soon as possible by any communication means available. For this purpose, you could contact them by using a CARS, SATCOM, or Stockholm Radio. Regardless of which option you might use, it is important to provide the information to your cabin crew as soon as the company is contacted and your questions are answered. Emergency and Evacuation Procedures In the airline, a set procedure exists for these kinds of situations, the night's briefing. This procedure is described in the Cabin Safety Manual, a manual you can find in your operation manuals. It is of the utmost importance you are familiar with this procedure as your cabin crew is trained to receive any information. Regarding an emergency in exactly this format. Nature of the problem. Keep it as understandable as possible and refrain from using too many technical terms. These might seem comprehensible to you but could be too complicated for your cabin service. Intention. What has been your decision and, in case applicable, where are we diverting to? Time. How much time is there left before we are estimated to be landing? Remember, your cabin crew probably still has to secure the cabin and prepare it for the emergency. Evacuation. Will an evacuation be required or not? Signs. What signs will you as the commander be giving to the cabin crew to initiate the evacuation? Remember, once you have given your night's briefing, and maybe some additional information, it is a requirement for your cabin service to repeat your briefing literally. This ensures you they have fully understood the extent of the situation. Once this has been done, do not forget to ask for updates from the cabin crew regarding the progress of their preparations in the cabin. You will be very busy trying to deal with the situation in the flight deck, trying to land the airplane safely, so this part is often overlooked. Their feedback is an important detail in your time management when dealing with the situation. Is the cabin secured? Are there any passengers in urgent need of medical assistance? Is there panic on board etc.? 
If an evacuation is planned, it is not necessary to specify which exits to be used. However, any information pertinent to the availability of exits would be appropriate. For the cabin staff, the basic philosophy for evacuation is to use all available exits. They will expect some to be jammed, underwater, blocked by fire, or otherwise unusable. On discovering an exit is not safe, they will abandon all attempts to use it and proceed to another exit. Each door slash exit will be evaluated before it is opened. You, as the captain, will be expected to remain on board to monitor the evacuation internally whilst your first officer will be in charge of guiding evacuated passengers away from the airplane on the outside. Also, it is important to highlight when the landing has been completed and the airplane has rested on the ground safely, evacuation might not be required anymore, for example, engine failure, therefore it would be important to remember that you might elect to cancel the emergency and for this purpose, you must inform passenger and cabin crew before intent to clear the runway. The cabin safety manual states when evacuation is no longer required, you must inform them by announcing cabin crew and passengers remain seated. Always remember, the safety of the passengers is of paramount importance, but the crew should not take unnecessary risks. Post-flight. Ensure that all relevant details are completed on the flight report and that any other special reports are completed. Do remember to thank the cabin crew for their efforts, particularly if they have worked hard on a busy or disrupted day. A little praise will go a long way toward making them feel valued both as an individual and as a crew member. Any particularly outstanding performances by the crew, good or bad, you may wish to record for posterity by writing a line or two to your fleet's chief pilot. He in turn will pass these on to cabin services for appropriate action. Communications with ground staff and company. This section deals in brief with aspects of communication with personnel other than members of your crew. It is not possible to cover all aspects of every conceivable situation with all concerned parties but the intention here is to advise you of lines of communication that are open to you and in some instances where to seek assistance. Air transport is an enormous collaborative effort. We, as pilots, are privileged to be at the forefront of this. Many responsibilities are placed upon us, both as captains and as pilots, so that the safety and regularity of air transport is maintained and improved. Equally, we can expect that all others who rely upon the airline industry in general, and the airline in particular, for their livelihood, should support us wholeheartedly. We must do our part by communicating adequately with all concerned and thus help to motivate them. Ground Staff Those that we have most dealings with are the dispatchers and engineers. Dispatchers Their responsibility is to liaise with and coordinate all those agencies required to ensure that the aircraft is safely and expeditiously prepared for flight and if possible to dispatch it on time. Their most obvious contribution may be the load sheet. They should be able to provide you with the following essential information. All documents pertinent to the flight, OFP, NOTAMs, weather briefing, etc. Information on departure delays and if available an estimate of holding delays at the destination. Details of any specials for example, disabled passengers. Deportees. Advice of any dangerous goods to be carried. The fuel load is required by the load controller for inclusion in the load sheet and the dispatcher usually collects this data. At many locations, they will pass the figure to engineering or refuelers on your behalf. Other items that you will from time to time need to discuss with the dispatcher. Passenger boarding time. Technical problems. ATC delays, to board or not remote holding to free the stand. Crew transport to and from the aircraft. Changes to load sheet. Extra cabin staff or supernumeraries on board. De-icing may need to be ordered via the dispatcher, although it is an engineering task, and may be better ordered directly via engineering. Either way order it early as it may well be in great demand, if you need it, so will others and you may have to wait in a queuing system. In any event, inform the dispatcher that de-icing will be necessary. The boarding or offloading of difficult passengers, for example, deportees. The boarding or offloading of difficult passengers, for example, drunks, deportees. Drunken passengers legally should not be boarded and unfortunately, some dispatchers won't take the initiative to offload them, preferring to make the cabin service director judge and jury. These passengers can get very aggressive and the situation might need your intervention. If this happens do not forget to report it using the appropriate form. Handling Agents at outstations, the coordination of the aircraft operation is controlled by the handling agent acting on behalf of the company. The handling agent normally has comprehensive communications available and is equipped with all means necessary to enable communication on the ground and in the air. 
requests for extra cleaning, engineers, toilet servicing, weather updates, etc. should all be passed by VHF radio to the handling agent at the earliest possible stage, thus giving them adequate time to react. Any queries about standing occupancy or request for a stand change may also be addressed to them. Operations Control Center OCC The Operations Control Center is responsible for the smooth running of the airline's aviation activities on a day-to-day -day basis. It is in everyone's interest for relations between the crew and OCC to be good. Furthermore, communication between the two groups needs to be beyond reproach. Remember that the OCC can be reached by a CARS, VHF or HF, phone, fax, telex, or if you are really lucky SATCOM. So if advice is needed, for example, on a rerouting, use of a non-standard alternate, call the OCC. Equally, if you have a problem that will affect the operation downstream, let them know, unplanned tech stop, any form of unserviceability which may delay or cancel the subsequent sector, crew sickness or incapacity, sick passenger requiring medical attention at the destination. All these, and more, the OCC will want to know about. It is better to give them too much information than not enough. Do keep the lines of communication open and keep OCC advised of your thinking when attempting to solve operational problems. It is quite possible that someone else has already experienced your problem on the same route previously and OCC knows the answer. If you don't speak to them you will never know. Remember, use all resources available to you to form the best possible bigger picture. Should you be faced with a diversion for technical or weather reasons and you are fortunate enough to have a range of alternates available, for example fuel is not yet a factor, then a call to OCC to ascertain where the best alternate from an operational viewpoint is essential to assist in the management of the operation. If, however, you are forced into an emergency diversion due to a serious situation developing, then different criteria apply. This is not an area for discussion or options, but if you find time OCC would appreciate a call so that they are aware of your intentions. It must be emphasized that such a call is an extra in these circumstances and in all probability you would not have sufficient time or capacity to make the call. In this case, a phone call or HF call after landing and after the situation is secure will put their minds at rest, and they will now know where you are, and what happened and can start to sort out the situation. Non-urgent calls to OCC are no less important. They enable you to pass your ETA and to give any further information that OCC may require, particularly if you are not running on schedule. The passing of basic defect information to the Maintenance Control Center, MCC, via OCC is an example. If some defect occurs after getting airborne, that will require investigation or rectification on arrival at the destination, then pass the details to MCC via OCC, or directly through a CARS. They can start the process of letting engineering at the destination know of the problem and also start locating possible spares that may be required. This also has the advantage that engineering can send an engineer of the correct trade, he in turn has the chance to refresh his memory from the maintenance manual and can bring with him any specialist tools or equipment needed. This simple initial act of forethought on your part will save a very valuable commodity, time. The overall message for dealings with the OCC is keep in touch. Note, in OCC, MCC and flight dispatch can be reached on the same VHF frequency. Make sure you know who to call in which situation. Flight dispatch and fleet office. Working in flight dispatch are several people with wide experience and particular specialist knowledge of the operation of our aircraft. Should you have a problem you cannot solve or need some advice on, use their expertise. A quick phone call or request on VHF or a CARS message to relay your query should give you the answer and put your mind at ease. In particular, the management pilots and the fleet office are all very experienced training captains, so the chances are they can solve your problem from personal experience. Flight ops support can help with unusual performance problems. Also, unusual requirements for on or off route alternates, details of airfields not in the performance manuals, and alternative routing OFPs are just a few of the items with which they can assist you. Engineering, MCC The relationship between pilots and engineers can at its most basic be described as. We bend them, you mend them. The professional regard between the two is probably greater than between any other two dissimilar groups in the airline industry. Perhaps because pilots and engineers are the only two professional groups in the industry that are specialists and are required, by law, to be licensed. However, just as cabin crew and pilots attract different types of people, pilots and engineers do not necessarily find communication straightforward. If you were, for example, to ask a pilot and an engineer for a description of a flight, just imagine how different each story would be. For the ground crew, the flight is already over by the time it is airborne. The flight will be defined by whatever problems or defects were remedied. 
they will remember the technical aspects more readily than the personnel involved. The ground maintenance role, an organizational and systemized function, ends when that of the flight crew starts and vice versa. The primary working interface between the two groups is the aircraft technical log. It is a common occurrence that when an aircraft goes AUG on a turnaround the majority of the station staff are too busy firefighting to be able to give OCC and MCC an accurate picture of the problem. All too often an incorrect picture is given by ground staff who have almost no technical knowledge. You, however, are temporarily redundant as your aircraft is being repaired, so a moment to call OCC and MCC with details of the technical aspect of the problem and the engineer slash your estimate of the delay to departure will be appreciated. Communications with passengers Almost all of your dealings with passengers will be by use of the PA. Practice makes perfect. Probably in the early days of your command, you will need to write down your PA as a script and edit it before delivery. Try to sound professional, do not speak too fast, and try to keep your PA short and to the point. Nothing puts passengers off more than a long rambling hesitant announcement. Passenger contact is inevitable. From time to time, you will come into direct contact with passengers, either on the airplane or in the terminal. Not surprisingly our passengers expect a certain standard from the aircrew, and especially the captain, to which they entrust their lives. Poor behavior, an apparent flippant attitude, or an untidy. Appearance may create an image that passengers cannot reconcile with their expectations. This may persuade some of these people to use other airlines or even other means of transport. Do make sure your crew is smart enough to appear in public, be particular, and insist on the uniform regulations being adhered to. Let us not lower our standards to those of certain of our competitors. Do not permit or engage in any horseplay in public. Remember that your behavior should be the yardstick for your crew. In case of an unexpected situation or emergency always make sure you inform your passengers accordingly. This is an art on its own as you do not want to go in too deep into the reasons why a diversion or certain decision might be necessary, but on the other hand, you do not want to leave them completely in the dark as well. It is a good idea to practice certain situations, and the most appropriate PA in each one of them, at home well before any actual situation arises. You will be grateful to yourself you did so on the day you need to use that PA. Remember, many passengers are still not very comfortable with air travel and they put all their faith in you as the captain. A reassuring word from you when the situation demands it will do wonders, both for them as well as for the safety of the entire flight.